So let's say we have this uh, velocity here. Uh, we don't know anything about the forcing uh, on this object. Now let's say that I tell you that the net force on this object is zero. In fact, let's say I tell you that there are no forces on the object, so the net force is zero. What does that tell you about the acceleration? Acceleration is zero. So is this object going to speed up or slow down over time? Speed down. Zero acceleration <laughs> means the velocity is constant. So it's just going to continue to move at that same constant velocity forever. Now again, this is very counterintuitive to people. What this is saying is we don't need any force to keep us moving to the right. It doesn't take any force to keep us moving. Um, people's natural sense is that movement is unnatural and it takes a force to make you move, but that's wrong. Um, it's not movement that's unnatural, it's acceleration that's unnatural. We don't need to explain movement, we only need to explain accelerations. Um, remember, another way of phrasing Newton's first law is that an object in motion tends to stay in motion. We don't need any explanation for why the object tends to stay in motion. Why is our intuition so bad about this? Um, well, we have very bad intuition about this because on Earth, the net force is never zero. So we don't have any chance to really think about this. For example, suppose you're driving your car and you take your foot off the gas. Well, the object, th that the car is going to slow down. Right? So it seems like you need to impose that force on the car to make it keep moving. Uh, but the reason for that is that you're always fighting against friction. On Earth, there's always friction trying to slow you down. Um, so the only way to keep moving is to impose a force to counteract friction. Uh, but if there were no friction, you wouldn't, take any, you wouldn't have to keep stepping on the gas to keep the car moving. Um, so if we were in outer space where there's no friction, once a spaceship starts moving, it just keeps moving indefinitely um, in a straight line unless there's some other force that's imposed on it. You guys ever seen the movie uh, Wally? Yeah. yeah. All right. Remember the scene where um, Wally and Eve are kind of dancing outside with the... Um, I can see you guys hate that scene, but I'll bring that up. So they're dancing outside with the um, fire extinguisher? Yeah. Right. So, what, what, uh, so Eve has a little engine, right? But Wally has no engine, so he just has the fire extinguisher to help him move. So what does he do? He fires the fire extinguisher, right? And that starts him moving. But he can't keep the fire extinguisher on all the time because he'd run out of, what, of, of the, uh, the fuel for the fire extinguisher. But notice when you watch the movie, he fires the fire extinguisher, and then he just keeps moving in that direction until he fires the fire extinguisher again. So that's a really good example of Newton's first law. Um, professor did it in class. Pardon? Our professor did it in class. He sat on a rolling right. chair and then let go. Ah. Right, right, so that's exactly like that scene. That's right. So you must, um, so um, if, if the chair doesn't have much friction, then you can see um, that once you start moving, you'll continue moving in a straight line in that direction unless you impose a new force. Now, most of the time in real life, it's not like Wally in that movie because there's friction to slow us down. But since there's no friction in space, once he starts moving in one direction, he keeps moving in that direction until he fires the fire extinguisher again. All right, so um, that part of uh, Newton's mechanics, the, the movie got very uh, got uh, exactly correct. Uh, on the other hand, they also they got it wrong because they said that there was sound in space. You can actually hear the fire extinguisher going off. So they got some stuff right and some stuff wrong. But. All right, but that's a good example of Newton's first law. Talk about uh, math for a second. Um, in this little equation here, let's say we increase y and we hold q and z constant. If we increase y and hold the other variables constant, what's going to happen to x? It's going to increase there's a direct relationship between y and x. That's right. Um, now let's say that we increase y and we hold the other variables constant. What's going to happen to z? Decrease. Because they're on the same side of the equation. If you increase y, but you're holding these variables constant, you'd have to decrease z in order to keep this still to be a true equation. All right, so it's very important to be able to look at any equation and see whether the variables are directly related or inversely related. In fact, in this equation, since this is just about multiplication and division, 
these are all directly or inversely proportional to each other. If we double y, we would double x. But if we double y, we would cut z in half, holding the other variables constant. Well, let's say that you increase the net force on an object. What would happen to the acceleration of that object? These are directly related. That's just common sense. If you're pushing with a greater force, you should get more result from that. Um, so if I'm going to write an equation, should f and a be on the same side of the equation or opposite sides? Opposite. To show that they're directly related. Now, let's say that you increase the mass of an object. Is that going to tend to make it have bigger accelerations or smaller accelerations? Smaller. Bigger. Smaller. Now, we should just be using common sense here. If something is more massive, is it easier or harder to accelerate it? Harder. 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 Based on our common sense, the bigger something is, the harder it is to accelerate it. Um, it's very easy for me to move my chalk holder around, um, but it would be very hard for me to, to um, move this building around, because it has got yeah. much more mass. All right, so should mass and acceleration be on the same side of the equation or opposite? Same. Same side to show that they're inversely related. So this is an equation you should have seen in class, but I'm just trying to show that in a way this is just common sense. This is telling us which of these variables are directly and indirectly related. There's a name for this equation. <coughs> this is Newton's second law. That's right. This is Newton's second law. I would say this is the most important equation in all of science. This is a very important equation. You're going to be using it a lot for the whole rest of the course. Uh, a lot of the next few weeks is going to be about using Newton's second law. Uh, so uh, in fact, there's a whole chapter in your textbook, I think, that's called Using Newton's Second Law. So that's one of the main things we're going to have to practice. Now, there's, a way, there's some ways in which this is not common sense. First of all, notice that um, Aristotle might have thought that you should put velocity in here. But no, the net force in an instant doesn't determine your velocity, it determines your acceleration. So that's not all that common sense. Also, this doesn't just say that things are directly related, but they're directly proportional. For example, if I double the acceleration, what happens to the net force? Double. It doubles, that's right. Suppose that I divide the mass by 3. What happens to the force? Divide that by 3. All right, so this also tells us about proportionalities. <laughs> now we can use this equation to figure out what a Newton is. What are the units for mass? Kilograms. Right. Not grams. The standard units for mass are kilograms, not grams. That's important to keep in mind. And what are the standard units for acceleration? So that tells us that a Newton must be kilogram meter per second squared. Because force here is in Newtons, so it must have the same units as mass times acceleration. So you shouldn't have to memorize what a Newton is. We can always figure it out as kilograms meters per second squared. So suppose that there is a force of eight Newtons on an object. What does that really mean? Well, that means that it has a force of 8 kilograms <coughs> meters per second squared. I think students have a hard time understanding complicated units like this. You're going to see a lot of these complicated units in the class. So how can we understand what this means? The trick is stick in the number 1. Isn't this really the same as 8 kilograms times 1 meter per second squared? So what that means is this force is big enough to accelerate an 8 kilogram object at 1 meter per second squared. So there really is a, a straightforward meaning to these complicated units. Or you could say that same force, if you had a 1 kilogram object, could accelerate it at 8 meters per second squared. You're going to see a lot of compound units in the course. And the way to interpret them is to stick in number 1. Um, so that obviously doesn't change things, but it helps us to interpret it better. So there is a straightforward meaning to these complicated units. If you had an 8 newton force, that means that if you had one kilogram, the force would be enough to accelerate it at eight meters per second squared. You have to use SI units for this formula. Um, you don't have any choices. You'll see lots of problems uh, in the homework where you're, say, given grams. Well, then you have to change that into kilograms. Or where you're given meter, uh, where you're given miles, we have to change that into meters. Everything has to be in SI units, because otherwise it won't come out in newtons. So you've got to put things in SI units. Remember, in kinematics, you don't have to use SI units as long as you're consistent. But here we've got to use SI units. Um, now, we're actually almost never going to use this formula. In fact, pretty much never. Instead, we're going to use 
these formulas. Remember that overall vectors are not very helpful. We have to break them into components. So this is Newton's second law broken into components. And again, it's almost never right to actually use this equation for solving a problem, because that would be mixing up the x and y components. Instead, you've got to use this equation for the x components and this equation for the y components, oftentimes both. Remember a second ago when we did two-dimensional motion, we saw how we needed two different frameworks, one for the x component and one for the y component. Well, when you're working with Newton's second law, <coughs> you usually need two different frameworks, one for the x component and one for the y component. We just plug those in. Okay. 